Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paul Chisnell. I'm Director of Sustainability at UK Finance, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar with PA Consulting on innovating towards a more sustainable living. Uh, for this, I'm joined by Mark Lancelot, uh, a very noble name, if I may say so, who is one of PA's Consulting's leading sustainability and circular economy experts, uh, Jason Hill, one of their leading financial services experts working, as I understand, with the challenges or disruptions even, disruptors even, uh, on sustainable finance. And also my colleague, Ben Rattenbury, manager of sustainability, who is gonna keep an eye on all of your questions. Um, we will open with a presentation from Mark and Jason. Uh, and I have to say, I'm looking forward to this, having had a sneak preview, uh, and we shall have plenty of time for Q&A. Now, before I hand over to Mark and Jason, I should add that the audience console on the left-hand side of your screen allows you to adjust the sound and the vision. And let me add that Google Chrome and Firefox are the recommended browsers for watching our webinars, and also that the quality can be improved by closing other applications such as Microsoft Teams. Uh, within the console, uh, you'll also find the Q&A button. And as I've just said, we'll have plenty of time for questions. Uh, and to answer your first question, or what's usually the first question, the presentation that, about, that is about to be given can be found within the uh, resources tab. And with that, let me hand over to Mark and Jason. Um, thank you very much and I'm um, delighted to be here today. Um, just very briefly, and just in a line, PA Consulting Group, we're an innovation and uh, transformation consulting firm with three and a half thousand people working across uh, 20 uh, countries. We work extensively um, helping both financial services firms move to more sustainable operations, as well as really importantly, and we're going to try and bring this to life a bit more with Mark, <clears throat> working across lots of other sectors, um, helping um, organisations uh, develop new innovative sustainable products, services and solutions, and we're going to try and bring some of that to life today. But uh, enough about PA and on to Mark. Yeah, thanks, Jason, and it's great to be here. Uh, just, just to build on what Jason said, uh, we're, we're really passionate about sustainability, so creating a positive human future is part, part of our core purpose at PA. Uh, and over the last five or six years, we've worked very closely with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, so looking at how business can bring the circular economy to life and the sustainability benefits from that, uh, and also with UN Global Compact, which is the, the largest corporate sustainability initiative in the world. In terms of the agenda for the session, so I'm going to lead the first half of it. So I'm going to share some perspectives on changing consumer sentiment towards sustainability uh, and increased awareness of the impact of our, our lives and how we choose to live. Uh, I'm particularly going to look into homes, to appliances and devices uh, and waste, uh, and also the role of financial services and products on our footprint, our sustainability footprint. And then Jason's going to pick up the second half of the conversation and talk about what financial service organisations can do to help individuals live more sustainable lives. So that's the plan for the next half hour or so as we go through the presentation. Uh, so I just wanted to start off with a, a view of consumers. So headline here is consumers increasingly care about sustainability uh, and that may not be, may not be revolutionary news for you. Uh, we've seen since 2017 uh, just increasing focus on, on single-use packaging, which is the thing that really uh, started to take sustainability into the mainstream. And then in recent years, we've seen climate change start to take a similar position and, and sort of mind share of consumers, whether that's been through Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and I'm sure we've all seen on the news literally over the last week or so, uh, the heat waves in North America and, and the flooding in Germany. So we're not in a place where sustainability is just, just a small cohort of passionate green advocates thinking about it. It's really now something that's in, in the mainstream awareness of consumers. And we'll see that played out on, on television adverts on a day-to-day -day basis and as well as the news that we see. Uh, so it's late last year we carried out some research into consumer attitudes towards sustainability. So we've got some headline results here I wanted to, to share with you. Uh, so firstly, uh, we found that 63% agreed that being environmentally friendly was as important as ever. Uh, and our research showed that it was being taken even more seriously since we started COVID. 
So it's, it's not gone away. It's actually uh, attuned people to the sustainability issues. Secondly, we see that sustainability is an increasing factor in who people choose to buy from and what they buy. So 43% trying to buy from brands with a strong purpose around sustainability and 50% happy to have a more limited choice of products available if it means being more sustainable. But given that, there's still a degree of confusion. So 48% agreed that there's more information on sustainability, so it's quite overwhelming. Uh, and we see that in, in research we do and the conversations we have with, with companies trying to operate in this space. So consumers say they care about it, but you ask them what it means and they start to get quite confused. Uh, and that really plays out into, into the fourth statistic here. So consumers want and expect brands and providers to take care of it for them. So it's important, it's confusing, I really want you to help me become more sustainable and live more sustainable lives. And last point just to make here, so, so the work we do with, with brands who are focused on particular customers and consumers and are focused on sustainability, the ones that are being successful are trying very hard to make it really easy for consumers to do the right thing. So really focusing in on any points of friction, removing those so, so it becomes easy to do the right thing. And the second insight we have is selling sustainability on its own remains very hard, despite what consumers say. Uh, and where we see people doing, being successful and doing clever things, it, it's starting to reinvent products and experiences with, with enhanced or different features or, or better user experience with sustainability built into the start. And whilst that's really difficult, if you can do it, it then becomes a source of real competitive advantage. So to build, build on that, uh, as I say, we're increasingly seeing that consumers are aware of, of the impact of how they live uh, on, the, on, the, on the world, on its people and on future prosperity. Uh, and the five items we're going to dig into, so, so firstly, looking at, at homes and buildings. So Heating our drafty homes in the UK currently contributes around 14% of UK greenhouse gases. Secondly, we're going to talk about the uh, consumption and waste, whether that's from food to clothing and household consumables and the impact of that. Thirdly, uh, the demand for sophisticated and smart appliances and devices which are filled with rare earth minerals can be hard to recycle. And many of them, particularly the small devices, end up sat in drawers, not being used. And we're then going to look at travel and electrification. So uh, cars are currently idle for over 90% of the time. They're not being used. So what's the opportunity there? As well as the obvious things around uh, sort of fossil fuel, uh, carbon emissions and air quality. Uh, and lastly, we're just going to touch on the role of money and where pensions and investments particularly, what impact they have on your sustainability impact. So making our homes environmentally friendly is technologically possible now, but it's difficult. As I said, it contributes to around 14% of UK greenhouse gas emissions. Part of addressing that going forward is going to be through new bills and building eco houses. Uh, and we'll see things like the future home standards, the, the ban on uh, fossil fuel heating coming into effect, it will start to address this. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is the existing housing stock. Uh, and the challenge there is how to do deep retrofit to address that, which is more than putting solar panels on the roof. It's really looking at where we can switch away from gas heating, where we can look at proper insulation, we can look at storage and heat pumps, or the ground pumps and, and air heat pumps. So, so these things are expensive, uh, they're disruptive, uh, but they're what's needed to tackle emissions and over the long term will deliver substantial energy savings to householders. But as a homeowner, that's, there's challenges there. So how do I know what to do? So navigating these different choices is complex, it's non-trivial. How do I find skilled and trusted installers who will do the job for me? And it's expensive and the payback period might be a long, long time 
and that mightn't fit with my view of how long I'm going to be in that house. So how does that kind of occupancy horizon play into that? But there are ways of making it easier and doing it more efficiently. For example, things like street by street retrofit is much cheaper from an inst installation perspective. Uh, if we look to the US, we can see some interesting innovations around uh, using property taxes to, uh, to fund uh, the, the improvements and tying those to a property rather than an individual. Uh, and we can also see companies starting to think about providing heat or cooling as a service. So again, starting to think about how do I, how do I buy access to heat or access to cooling rather than how do I buy the, the physical equipment and installation of that. If we then look inside the home, our domestic appliances and devices have a direct and indirect impact on our sustainability footprint. So clearly we can think about things like energy consumption and we've all seen sort of shifts to, to more energy efficient devices, whether that's uh, dishwashers, fridges, freezers, things like that. But all these devices have uh, increasingly have electronics and, and are clever within them. And this volume of e-waste is ever increasing, so about 155,000 tonnes in the UK. Uh, and they have these rare minerals in them. So did you know that there's more gold in a tonne of e-waste than there is in a tonne of gold ore that's mined from the ground? And we start to see interesting startups and innovators who are mining that urban waste to, to get to that gold and other, other rare minerals. And it's not just about usage as well. So, so much of the footprint of, of devices is in production, but then through the usage and end of life stage. So how do we start to understand those and maybe make choices around the full impact of, of what we buy? I think part of the innovation we see across businesses now is this, this move to service models, where providers offer a service or access to a device rather than selling the product. Uh, and that's, that's really important because it is then a commercial incentive for the provider to think about extending use, extending value, how do I recover the materials, how might I uh, minimise energy consumption through that because that's, that's part of my commercial model now as opposed to passing that off to a consumer. So we see examples of companies providing laundry as a service. So there's a number of companies like Bundles in the Netherlands doing that. Uh, many of you will have heard of IKEA's furniture as a service trial that they're running in many companies now as well as their, their take back scheme uh, and then there's companies like Graver where you can you can rent consumer electronics on a short term basis or a long term basis rather than having to purchase, purchase it outright. And we also see the waste associated with our consumables. Uh, so it's estimated that over 17% of food waste is wasted, sorry, 17% of food is wasted in the UK, most of it after purchase. On average, over 50% of clothes in someone's wardrobe have not been used in the last year. Uh, so there's this huge opportunity to, to think about waste and to think about uh, assets and products that aren't, aren't used. In the UK, we have this big focus on recycling. But we should know that much of what is recyclable is not actually collected and therefore not recycled. And even if it does go into the recycling bin, it doesn't necessarily go into a recycling stream. It can end up in landfill or even incinerated. And we should also remember that, that recycling isn't always the best option. So if we go back to the, the waste hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle, recycle is the bottom one, so it's better than disposing things. But if we can think about ways of reusing products that we bought or refurbishing them and repairing them, that is a much better uh, environmental impact than, than necessarily recycling. And we see we see that with some of the service innovators, so uh, Rent the Runway and many others in the, in the fashion space, renting clothes. Some of you may have seen the debates in the media in the last few weeks. Uh, criticizing the sustainability of renting clothes. I think it's quite interesting if you dig into, into what's been said. Uh, it's actually quite simple in a way. You know, if, you're, 
you're renting out clothes that don't get used very much and get shipped long distances and get uh, cleaned by sort of harsh energy intensive dry cleaning methods then it's probably not that sustainable but where you can get multiple use and you can do local distribution and think about cleaner what more environmental and friendly ways of cleaning it then those models have a much better footprint than, than purchasing and not using things and we also can see in the food waste space there's, there's various companies uh, either looking at food that's not used and finding use uh, sort of matching it to people who need food and the food banks uh, or also using food waste to create things like animal feed through insect farming And last last point I wanted to touch on really was I'm thinking about about finance. So something closer to the heart of many of you on the call today. Uh, the biggest impact we can have on sustainability is probably through how we manage our money and investments. So we've seen through 2020 this rapid inflow of, of money into ESG investments. So I think quadrupling. Uh, Bloomberg recently forecast that by 2025, a third of global assets under management would be ESG assets. Uh, and the part of the thought behind that, as well as thinking about risk and return, uh, there's also a sort of responsible investment thought behind it. So the view that you can have a much bigger impact uh, from tilting or pivoting your investments to more sustainable investments and that can have an outweigh, outsized effect than getting an electric car or living in an eco house or going vegan or stopping flying. So earlier this year, Nordea published research and they estimated that, that moving to sustainable finance was 27 times more impactful than uh, a more sustainable living choice of electric cars and eco houses and vegan and stopping stop flying. Uh, and even more recently, uh, Make My Money Matter uh, did a similar piece of research and had a figure of 31 times. So uh, a key point here is, is the multiplier, it's you know, orders of magnitude uh, more impactful. Uh, so my sort of closing thought here is moving to sustainable finance from an individual's perspective, it could be the greenest thing you can do. I think the question for, for us in the industry is, you know, do customers know this? Do they care about it? And if they do, are they able to act on it? So I'm going to hand over to Jason now, who's going to pick up the conversation and start to explore how we think financial services can innovate to help individuals live more sustainable lives. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> um, so what can financial services firms do to support this uh, transition to more sustainable living. I think over the last couple of years there's been a huge focus on uh, on risk. Have you properly analysed the risks across your portfolio of customers, your stock of housing, the concentration of your lending to certain sectors? Um, I'm not going to really focus on that today. What I really would like to talk a little bit about are the opportunities ahead and where we're seeing some of the innovation and where there's a huge opportunity for more innovation. Um, to to d delight your customers and the first thing really to do is center on the customers um, have you spoken to your customers have you properly spoken to them it is more than likely that they want to do something whether that's individuals or businesses large and small um, but they don't know where to start or worried about the cost involved in any transition and customers really need help from a trusted source before I go through um, some of the ideas around the five themes that, that Mark um, briefly touched on, we're just going to undertake a very simple poll uh, with the audience. So hopefully you will have the access to the poll. And there are what well, the question we'd like I'd like to ask is where do you see your organization making the most impact as we transition to a sustainable world? Is it? And if have we launched the poll? I think you can probably see the event poll on, on, the, on the part of your screen. So is it in developing new sustainable products and services? 
or is it improved accessibility and affordability of sustainable finan financing products and services to your customers? Could it be partnering with other organizations or perhaps you would get really focused in on um, financing and supporting their, their as a service or circular business model? Or finally, do you think you have the biggest impact by advising your customers on how you can live more sustainably? I'm going to give the audience now a few uh, a few seconds to decide and vote. And we'll come back to the survey results uh, in the Q&A session at the end, end of this um, session today. Okay, I think that's probably enough time. Mark, if we could move to the next slide, please. So of the five themes, I just want to touch firstly on conscious investing. Consumers are definitely demanding that their finances and investments make a positive impact on society. Um, there's already a number of app-based ethical investment platforms focused on the retail market, and quite a few experiments also underway trying to quantify an individual's carbon impact, helping them change their behaviors as a result. Um, we see though that important next trend is in <clears throat> further personalizing services and solutions to best reflect what matters to an individual do you want your money to be supporting local businesses or protecting wildlife or even invested in sustainable startup tech firms there are quite a few options out there to spend money and get a tree planted but is this really enough is it really making the impact and a simple statement from biden or boris could wipe billions of the value of firms that your investments are made in significantly impacting your long-term wealth <clears throat> fortunately we're starting to see esg funds outstripping in terms of performance traditional funds um although i hear that um people, that some of these funds there's such a growth in the funds that that's um, they're struggling to find um enough firms to invest in at the moment but hopefully that that will that'll be fixed on to the next one, please, Mark. Uh, sorry, make the sustainability for us. Thank you. Um, upfront costs for retrofitting houses or commercial property are really prohibitive. Um, and that there has been little innovation so far in helping customers transition. There are a number of mortgages. There are uh, just over a year ago, there were, I think there were two a sustainable mortgages on the market. They, at uh, the last count of that counted last week, there's over 26 different deals, um, uh, which is fantastic. Some of them are actually market leading in terms of rates. Um, for example, there's one uh, has 1.1% on a two year fixed rate. Um, a lot of them though, focused on new builds. And as Mark touched on, it's really retrofitting, which is really, really the really thing we need to, we need to crack. Um, Nationwide have recently launched a uh, green home loan. It's got a discounted initial rate. Um, as long as 50% of the money is spent on green initiatives such as insulation, double glazing, heat pumps, <clears throat> or electric vehicle charging points for the house. So there's fantastic innovation there. Um, I think there's a huge opportunity for, for some, someone to enter the market to attach some of these long-term costs for making uh, the your your home efficient to the home rather than to the individual and finally we're starting to see now the, emer the emergence of instant savings products with a sustainability focus and not just to focus on the e but also start to see on the s tandem have a rate leading 0.4 percent uh, green instant access product some building societies are starting to focus here too ecology you've got an isa that supports sustainable projects um, Saffron Building Society have an Enviro Saver that, that, that supports charities. So this is a real thing, focusing project products on specific customer needs. Touching briefly on partnerships, we really need to stick to what you know well and engage the wider ecosystem to draw on expertise and a track record to support your new products and propositions. A really excellent example of this is a recent, the recent partnership between NatWest and Octopus Energy to install electric vehicle points and battery storage solutions and some great innovation. 
and Klarna, uh, um, the Buy Now Pay Later organization, are now offering individual carbon footprint reports based on your spending profile. They've partnered with a firm called Doconomy uh, to help do that from production to delivery, office front door. The feature delivers uh, an estimated carbon emission for each purchase and allows users to track the cumulative carbon footprint over time. What I'd like to see more of now is giving people the choices to choose more sustainable options at that point, pre-point of sale. You're not quite seeing yet. NatWest have also entered the carbon monitoring game. They've just put uh, a service bolted onto their um, uh, customers' current accounts app um, to, to track carbon, carbon spend. And we're increasingly seeing firms like EcoVardis being used by financial services firms to help start to manage and track the sustainability of, of their supply chains. That's all good news. The circular economy and um, providing things as a service is a great opportunity for financial services firms to enter. Is there a role for you to help bundle up washing machines and laptops or other electronic goods? Um, can you help roll it up, manage it as a single entity or solution, or simply provide the finance for, for as a service solutions? And as things get smarter, there's lots of work and therefore opportunity to be done integrating and managing and potentially monetizing the data that's involved in that. There's also an opportunity to support community-led initiatives who have the idea, the drive and the desire, but may need financial support to deliver. For example, community energy schemes Providing things as a service though, there are quite a few issues to be considered. Who owns the asset? What's the residual value of at the end of life? And, and all of these things represent risk. So is there an opportunity to help manage that risk, either on the consumer side or the supplier side? Clever monitoring um, may, help, may help reduce the risk profile and uh, allow you to offer better, better risk insurance premiums. Talking of insurance, <clears throat> There are increasing number of really brilliant and innovative micro insurers and insurance solutions. You can just turn on and off. You want to take your, your expensive camera out, it's automatically insured only when it leaves the house. Or electric scooter rental, um, instant insurance as soon as you've taken out the rental. So again, lots of innovation, but there can be lots more. Finally, customers really do at this stage want more than just a list of products. They're desperate for relevant advice, guidance and ideas to help them transition to a sustainable future. There are real opportunities for financial services firms to curate information, build uh, information hubs, provide advice and guidance and tap into their own customers' expertise to provide a rich experience, joining up and connecting those dots across their portfolio of customers. I know it's, uh, it goes without saying that getting your own house in order is an important requisite uh, in becoming the trusted advisor and I recently did a, uh, a quick and dirty survey of, the, of many of the largest UK banks and building societies websites. Just about every one of the um, sustainability sections of the website talked about their own journeys, that how they were going to make themselves um, sustainable, how they were improving their supply chains etc. It was actually really difficult to find any real advice as a consumer and guidance to help me. And I think that's such a missed opportunity for financial services firms. So that's our whistle stop uh, tour of, um, of sustainable living. We now have a good chance for some questions and answers. Great, thanks. Thanks very much for that. And uh, as you as you were speaking, I was scribbling down what I thought the uh, subtitles might be for your or the subtitle might be for your presentation. And in the first instance, I was thinking the importance of the circular economy, but actually, I I, I landed on uh, perhaps the third age of the service economy, uh, because I think a theme running through there is how can you know financial services firms in particular think about supporting customers as they think about um really le leaning into to more sustainable uh, approaches and quite often there's not front cost there um ben how are we doing with questions we've got loads of good questions coming in actually so shall i far away with the first set of questions yeah please do thanks paul well there's, there's two related questions that i think are a good starting point firstly do banks and other financial service providers have sufficient understanding of their customer needs? And related to that, 
Does the panel have any views on the extent to which customers are willing to pay more for sustainable products? So I'll, I'll, um, I'll pick that one up first, Mark. Um, I don't think um, any organization asks um, or, or, or digs into customers' needs enough, actually. I think um, it, it's, it, it's historically been a, a product-driven um, industry. And actually, what, what we're, starting to, we're starting to see, but it's still not enough, a pivot towards thinking about customer outcomes, customer needs, customers' pain points. Um, and, that, and that is a good thing. But I think that, that we, we start at PA, everything we do starts with, with, with the customer's needs, the customer's problems, customer-centered design. Um, and, and I think there's a, there's a long way to go across, across the entire um, uh, industry in that regard. And then very briefly on uh, what customers willing to pay more. The tipping point is that customers shouldn't have to pay more. Um, why should you pay more to be more sustainable? It, that's, that's, that's how the, the industry started, where ESG funds were a slightly lower return, but you were doing good. There's no reason for that to be the case anymore. Um, it's, it's, it's actually a, a, a positive change now. So customers actually should pay less. Well, yeah, so on the latter point, absolutely, and, and that finding, you know, is borne out in, in other sectors as well. So, you know, there's a small cohort of people who will pay more and can afford to, but for the majority, when it comes down to it, it's almost, I think it will become kind of a license to operate, they will expect it. And if you look at some of the, you know, underpinnings of this, if you, if you look across the medium and long term, there's a strong argument that sustainable investments will be less risky. Uh, and we've seen that borne out through, through COVID. And, and as, as I'm sure you're aware, lots of industry voices have that view that, you know, if, if a business isn't thinking about sustainability in the future, it can't be doing strategy very well. So once you start to take a medium to long term perspective, I think it becomes a compelling view that uh, these products and services, you shouldn't have to pay more for them. Uh, and just kind of on, on, on the first point, so, you know, re recognizing the importance of understanding what consumers think about sustainability. We're, we're, we're currently engaged in a research piece of work, uh, surveying that across UK and, and Northern Europe to get a handle at a quantitative level of what consumers think about sustainability. So, uh, very interesting to see what comes out about and we'll be kind of talking talking out to the market around what insights come from that. Ben, do have a next, next question? Great, thanks very much. Yep, okay, two more questions uh, just come in from the audience, so please do keep those questions flooding in. So firstly, what types of green products and services would you expect to be rolled out over the next year? And then related to that, do you think that traditional or established financial institutions have any distinct advantages or disadvantages to being successful regarding sustainability compared to challenger banks? Do you want to ask the first one to start with, Mark? Or I'll pick up the traditional versus challenger? Yeah, so, so in terms of what green products and services, so, uh, I mean, you, Jason talked about mortgages uh, so we would expect there to be more in that space and, and I, I I think just given the opportunity to, to help people do retrofit so I think moving into that space so it's not just about the purchase of a house but how you might make, make it more sustainable it feels like there's a an opportunity there and I expect that to be coming to market more strongly uh, clearly the sort of investments and pension space, there's already a lot happening there and I think that will continue to grow. I think there's challenges there both in terms of you know availability of underlying companies and businesses to invest in who are genuinely sustainable uh, and then the whole challenge around transparency uh, and you know avoiding risk of greenwash. And there's lots of activity uh, happening in that space. For example, there's going to be a sustainable finance taxonomy and the work in the UK around the green taxonomy, uh, really trying to, to to address that risk and help consumers know what they're buying. And so the third area I'd mention is around payments. So 
so you know starting to recognize that at the point of purchase was an opportunity either at that point or after it to start to give people a view of uh, the impact of what they're buying and start to kind of nudge their behaviors so, so again you know the, the, the small players in that space uh, i think mastercard relatively recently announced an initiative to tackle that so i, I would expect that to come on stream uh, and potentially be something that's much more visible factor when when each of us is making individual purchases and just to build on those and then i'll just start on the traditional message challenges i think ratings are going to become more and more and more important from a whole supply chain um uh the ability to do business with people the refusal to do business with others and i think that will start to cascade that will start to be internal and b2b to start with and we're seeing that already with the rise of you know things like eco vardis and uh, having a company score um through to actually uh, consumers started to pick up some of some of that um that importance and some leveling off of of, of who's who's more sustainable than others and, and choice there the other um area of innovation i did touch on it but i think the s of esg and new services and solutions around that space i think we will see really start to accelerate um through through the next through the next 12 to 18 months um and then um moving on then to the traditional versus challenges the challenge banks have, there's such huge variety so you know from the digital startups to the mid-tier specialists um I, the, the the larger traditional um uh, banks and insurers have the opportunity to make the biggest impact we'll see a lot of innovation i can see we're sure we'll see a lot of continued innovation from the challenges and and and, and the startups um and and hopefully as has been the wave with um uh, over over the last 10 years some of the bigger traditional banks will do a bit of copying perhaps uh, and building on some of these new ideas and and taking them to a much broader audience and if i can just make an observation before we, we turn to the next question you you've called out the um the s and i i agree with that I, you know i think that actually the COVID 19 experience has told us that we ought to be concerned uh, about making sure that we can bring about changes in a fair and equitable way. Um, I, I actually do think that, that we should bear in mind that um, this isn't just about climate either, it, it, it's that broader E piece as well. And I thought it was really interesting that you reminded us that really that first instance of real mass awareness wasn't around climate actually, it was around single use plastics and the harm they're, they're, they're causing. Uh, and I was just wondering whether or not you, you you think that in the same way that we're beginning to see, um, and I would think there'll be more of them, uh, payments companies wanting to be able to show us uh, our emissions, uh, carbon emissions, uh, and to track that. Do, do you think there'll be a broader focus on the environment as we look ahead to the next 12 months? Yeah, maybe I'll pick up that to start with. So, so I think the plastics issue is really interesting because, um, you know, as you say, it's the thing that grabs everyone's mind share and still consumers are very tuned to it. And if you go and talk to, you know, consumer goods companies and, and the whole plastics packaging change, you know, there's a, there's a huge way for them to go, but there's, there's big programs of work and money trying to work out how to do that. Uh, I think the thing that's interesting is, you know, unlike climate, where there's now a spotlight on banks to look at finance and climate risk and the impact on that, uh, there isn't yet the same focus on biodiversity impact and the impact of financing plastics and how it's addressing that. So, and it's kind of a slightly different topic than what we're talking about here, but I, I think it's an interesting thing to see how that uh, plays out in the, in the coming years as, to the, as some of the, the risk and measurement frameworks around biodiversity and natural capital start to mature and those things become measurable and tangible and a bit more actionable then. Uh, but I think, as you said, you know, for then as an individual, you know, how do I, how do I understand my, my sort of footprint in terms of biodiversity or plastics or natural capital? And, you know, it's an area where I think there's place to the confusion point. So, you know, you buy some from the supermarket and there's all these different icons and labels and most of them don't actually mean what people think they mean. So the, the kind of two arrow one, which looks like recycling, 
it doesn't mean that it's not recyclable you know, so, so there's a whole piece around engagement and communication I get back to Jason's point around there's this need for to trust and someone to trust to tell me the right information that I can that simplifies the choices I have to make rather than looking at it and it's super complicated and I've got a busy life and I just want to buy something from the supermarket. So, so I do think the, the payments companies particularly as some of the, the measurements and data sources come online, we will see people start to innovate in that space. And, and before I hand back to Ben, let me, the, be, let me be the first person to hold his hand up and say, I had assumed that that kind of uh, circular image with the two arrows, one white, one black. I, I had always assumed that was um, uh, meant, meant recyclable and it was the most clearest in, in sign that you could have of that. But presumably, as we know, it's uh, you need to check against your local, uh, you know, what, what, what's collected in what way and, and, and what isn't. Um, yeah. Can be must be made easier, mustn't it? And in fact, I mean, that, that before I do hand over to Ben, I mean, hand back to Ben, I mean, that actually shows the, 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 the FCA uh, earlier this week produced a, a, a Dear Chair letter on their expectations around um, what people say about uh, uh, sustainability when it comes to ESG and sustainable investment funds. And I could sum up that letter as, you know, keep it quite simple, make sure that it's understandable and only make claims that you can then substantiate. This is all quite important, isn't it? That people do have a clear understanding of what's on offer and then actually whether the promises are being delivered. Yeah, very much so. Um, I I'm surprised there aren't um, sustainable finance best buy tables yet. Um, it's just a matter of time. And then actually they will be the, the number one vote buy tables to look at, whether that's for savings, mortgages, um insurance products energy we're starting to see we start energy actually are ahead uh, of the curve in that regard you know with um things like Obo and octopus really do it really focusing on their uh, renewable credentials i i can easily see that i'll be opening my sunday papers in not but perhaps it's still a year or two away but certainly within the next few years opening my sunday papers and just having one of those clear you know let's give you an esg guide i can see that coming uh, but it, it, probably way a little way off, but it it'll time will fly. Ben, where where should we go next on questions? Thanks very much, Paul. Okay, we've got more more good questions coming in, so I'd like to group three of them in this batch. So, firstly, when it comes to banking, is it all about green products and services, or does it come down to something else? Secondly, are the needs of different customer groups being adequately met? And third, are banks thinking big enough and innovatively enough, or should they be pushing the envelope more? Um, going, we're going backwards. Um, the, it currently is about products. It's not really about services. Um, and and you know, I think we need it, it, that, that, that banks need to go through that journey of not just, not just greening their products, but back to where we started about thinking about what the customer's needs are. And, and, and designing services and solutions. And I think more often than not, in partnership with, 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 with other, other firms, non-financial services firms. And that's where you'll see the real innovation. And that's where you'll see the, um, people pushing the envelope much more than, than sticking a green label on an uh, on, on instant, instant, instant saver. Um, uh, is it, is, I think the first question was something, is it, is it all about um, green products and services? Um, not, not uh, hard, hard question to answer. It's, it's. This is, I guess, this is really, this, it's, it's, it's really important, and and we're at, we're at a tipping point, and, and, and actually, um, if, if financial services firms don't change and offer services and solutions that are that, that help help customers' um, uh, needs, then actually they're going to be left behind pretty quickly. I think it's going to accelerate really rapidly over the next three to five years. And, and just just to build on that, so I mean, if you go back to the challenges, you know, an individual or a small business might have to become more sustainable. You know, finance is only one part of that that question. So, 
you know, there's an opportunity for the banks and others to, to, be, to kind of create ways of being involved in that discussion, whether that's through partnerships or platforms. Uh, so the choice is, you know, do, do you start to engage and into that conversation, which would then flow into a need for, for, for financing products and services, or do you want to wait some, do you want someone else to have that conversation with your customer, and then you're into much more kind of transactional relationship? So I think that that sort of stretch, you know, if you want to be truly customer centric, what's your what's your role and where do you want to play in helping consumers and customers through this sustainability transition? Yeah, and I, I, I actually think if we remind ourselves um, within the PRA supervisory expectations, they ask people not to put climate risk into a silo. They say think about climate risk in terms of traditional credit marked and, and operational risk, but they also make this distinction, don't they, between physical risk and transition risk. Yeah. And I actually do begin to think that transition risk is actually the risk that comes if you stand still while the world around you moves on. Uh, and I think it's very true. You, you know, if you're going to meet your customer needs, then actually you, you need to work out what it is that they need for, from you in order to help them on their net zero journey. I think that's very true. Um, yeah. And I think there's a, there's a question before about you know the advantages that maybe a large bank might have over over a challenger bank, and I think part of that advantage is the sort of breadth and coverage that they might have in particular industries and up and down the supply chain. And being able to you know, potentially take a view of the transition risk and maybe able to start to work with different players across that to help them through that because you know, these challenges quite often require change and action in different places from different parties so that convening coordinating uh, there's a real need for that and, and I think just given where where banks might have those relationships and networks, that there's something there to, to build on, and that moves into this sort of advisory, broader set of services that you could offer. We're starting to see that in agriculture, aren't we, Mark? You've got some good examples of of, of innovations to help farmers um, uh, either use less water or identify um, crop performance issues earlier or uh, animal husbandry. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it can be the big brands at the top of the supply chain who are the ones you know, agitating for action and trying to find ways of you know, how do I help those companies who might be three, four, five, six steps away down my extended supply chain. And actually, that's a salutary reminder that quite often you, you, you do need to, to be quite specific here because the needs of one sector will be very different from the needs of another. Yeah, yeah, huge so. I mean, there are so many um, um, mid-size um, factory owners um, operating on really thin margins, using high carbon, high energy, high water potentially um, uses just to keep their businesses going. And you know, it's not that they 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 don't want to move to more sustainable, lower you uh, know um, uh, industry practices. They just haven't got the advice or guidance or help to help them pivot to um, to more sustainable practices and and it's in the it's in it's in the in the bank's interest to help them with that because it's 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 their customer portfolio that they're supporting here to be more to, to be more enduring and to actually survive I, I i agree and a, a big part of that just transition dialogue that we're certainly party to is actually appreciating that even if the the, the long-term goal is is moving us to a net zero economy actually you've got to have that dialogue with your customer base in terms of understanding that in many instances people are really concerned about the here and now and where they're going to be in a month or two's time yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely then where next thanks paul well these are actually the final two questions so this is the, the last call for anyone who would like to ask a question to add them now but the last two questions are about specific types of financial service activity. So firstly, how can private banks do better than other banks in terms of sustainability? And secondly, what does the transition mean for the products and services banks should offer their SME and corporate clients? Okay. Yeah, you, you want to start, Mark? 
Yeah, about a couple in the first one, and maybe take the second one. So, th so I think you know, private banks and into kind of wealth management. Um, you know, clearly it'll depend on the kind of needs and, and wants of the clients, but there's the potential to take a take a longer view, uh, and I think that very much plays to if you look at the risk from the different sustainability factors in the kind of short and medium term. I think there's opportunities to to, to manage that risk and think about who who the kind of winners would be going forward. Uh, you know, some of the conversations I've had with, with wealth managers as well, you know, that they seem to think that, you know, in the coming years, as we see this shift in sort of inter intergenerational wealth, that sustainability is going to become a much bigger topic as, as perhaps uh, sort of younger folk who may be more attuned to this want to ensure that uh, their wealth is invested in ways that's meaningful for them. You know, and given as that transition as a, as a point of intervention to, to, to make it make that happen. So, so I do think I do think it's interesting. Uh, I think that my my experience from, from talking to some companies is it's quite varied in terms of whether this is part of the dialogue with clients at the moment. I think mean, some are, but some some clearly aren't yet. So, uh, from a Client servicing perspective, I think I think there's more to do just to kind of raise awareness of the opportunities and the risks. Uh, uh, what it means. Yeah, and and just just to add to that, I, I think there is a, la a lack of um, ability to educate and coach. But fundamentally, the, there needs to be a, a wider set of services and solutions that outperform the market. And if they outperform the market, then private banking clients will be will be investing and buying those products. And, and it's a simple, it's simple, it's a pinpoint equation um, for me. You know, there's a huge amount of money going into ESG funds because they're doing well. Fundamentally, they're doing they're doing really well. Um, they're investing in long term, fantastic business opportunities and ideas. They're helping others transition to um, more sustainable practices, and 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 as a result, they're they're outperforming the market at the moment. And and I think that will only accelerate. So build build great great services and solutions and uh, and give them access to products and explain to them that it's, it's worth their while <clears throat> i think we sort of picked up already some of the, uh, the 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 second question which is about um uh sme customers i think in as part of our a part of our last dialogue um i, I think um given the numbers of of, of sme businesses uh, across the uk there's a huge opportunity to innovate in new services and solutions to support their to support their transition, and, and I think and I think there's a, a reasonable uh, with what I see in the market. There's quite a lot of um, activity now underway to start to rethink what those what those services and solutions can be, and what the advice and guidance uh, that can be developed and provided in gen in partnership with with other non uh, financial services industry um, organisations to help them. Um, understand what steps they can and should take. So Ben, I don't know whether you want to to try and, and pose one very final round of questions because I see the questions are still coming in. Um, they, they are Paul, yeah, so why don't I quickly try and cover off the last two questions. So firstly, how do you see the potential role for guarantees in some of this work? For example, how do I know that as a consumer, I will see changes in my carbon footprint? And secondly, how bankable is the EPC measure as an overall validation of environmental impact? Is there a transitional risk in relying on this as an absolute measure of sustainability? That's all the question. Thanks. Excellent. And we will draw a line there because we're, we're getting close to, to our allocated time. So, so, so yeah, so I start, you might have to repeat the second one, Ben, or stick it in the chat so I didn't quite catch all, all the details of it. So uh, I think, so this question around how do I know that, that what I buy actually does what it says on the tin, I think is a really important question. Uh, it's a non-trivial question. So to understand the whole impact of 
you know, if I buy a product, I understand the whole impact from extraction right through production, through use to end of life is usually complicated. So there's lots of innovations happening around getting hold of the data and the measurement approaches and standards to do that. So that, that's one sort of complex problem that, that's being worked on but, but isn't truly solved yet. And then you have to think, as we were saying before, well, there's my carbon footprint, but then also what about the impact on biodiversity versus natural capital versus social factors? And how do I understand the trade-offs between them? Because if I just take a narrow view and focus on one, that becomes quite challenging. Uh, so, you know, we, there's a role here for companies to do due diligence of what they can and to recognize that there's an evolving field of measurements and standards and what's available and what's known and to, to try and be trusted to always be doing taking that best view. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's work like the Green Taxonomy in the UK which is looking to, to, to build and start to put some stronger standards in place that people can trust what, what they what they're buying from the financial services product right? but you know there's, there's more work to do and i think it's going to be you know a topic for some years going forward before before we can solve this definitively yeah um and to, it sort of answers the second this the second one i'll sort of join the join the two together is how bank or epc is as a measure and um you know ratings and measures it's it's a it's a complex business better to have something that's reasonably standardized than nothing and we're starting to see um you know a, a whole host of sustainable ratings uh, organizations uh, appear all with slightly different measures i know that lots of asset managers have real struggles with defining what their um what their measures and standards should be and how they can compare and contrast it's just the, the myriad of global companies that are out there with a single measure uh, uh, there is currently no right or wrong answer, but as long as you have some transparency through that chain and the reasoning why those, those measures and ratings have been taken up and, and actually why inventing yourself partner back to partnerships and, and using using some of those um, those, those, those companies with global reach who specialise in, 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 that, in that measurement, I think is, 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 is a good thing. It's not perfect, but I don't think we're ever going to get perfection in this space. And just to sort of reinforce that point around innovation, so there's lots happening in sort of spatial finance, I think, but it's a basically satellite Earth observation applications which are increasingly sophisticated and starting to, you know, do daily real-time monitoring of land usage. I think there's satellites going up next year that will start to do real-time carbon emissions. So, so there's things happening which will start to provide data that can underpin some of this uh, and then you need to build the, the, the measurement systems and providers and standards to do it. So it, it will evolve and it's evolved quite quickly, uh, but it's going to be in flux for, for a period of time. That's great. And I, I am going to uh, draw a line there to make sure that we can finish within our allotted 60 minutes. Um, I, I realise actually what we didn't do is feedback on the poll, um, but we can do that in perhaps a, a, a write-up of this. Uh, and in any event, I suspect the answer that you might have been hoping for, at least certainly the answer that I think I've heard is all of the above, uh, because I, I actually, in advance of your presentation, probably would have leaned towards um, ticking one of the first two, two, two answers. But actually, as you uh, as we went through the dialogue, I think I began to realise that a lot of this is about advising uh, clients as well. Um, so with that, I am going to thank our, our speakers from uh, PA Consulting, Mark and Jason. I think it's been a really interesting uh, 60 minutes. I'm going to thank Ben for being such a fantastic uh, question master. I'm going to thank Helen, our producer. And I'm going to thank you all for joining us and indeed for making this such a, an interactive uh, experience. It's, it's been really helpful to have that dialogue and I, and I think really, uh, really insightful. Um, that rounds off our sustainability related webinars uh, as far as UK finance is concerned for this side of the summer, uh, though we will be back in autumn. 
and indeed will be back uh, during COP26, uh, though we're still actually giving all that thought, uh, and no doubt we'll be in touch. Uh, so thanks again.